Welcome to this Radcliffe Cardiology Roundtable event where we're discussing mitral valve interventions. I'm Simon Kennan. I'm an interventional cardiologist at the London Chest Hospital, and I am editor of Interventional Cardiology Review. In this final session, we will be discussing percutaneous mitral valve implantation, both valve in valve, valve in ring, and de novo implantation. Of course, we have an expert panel here, and I'll introduce them. We've got Professor George Lutter uh, from Germany, a cardiac surgeon, Darren Milet, an interventional cardiologist from Galway, Ireland, Nina Wunderlich, an imaging specialist also from Germany, Neil Mote, a cardiac surgeon from the Brompton in London, and finally Lars Sondergaard, an interventional cardiologist uh, from Copenhagen. Neil, could you tell us what your experience is with valve in mitral valve procedures? Yes, I mean, I think I think this is the sort of new kid on the block in uh, in the field of structural heart intervention. I think with in the recent meetings at TCT and here at PCR London Valve, there's a great enthusiasm in in this area um, for. Uh, implanting valves, transcatheter mitral valve implants, or TM, TMVI, rather than repair strategies. Um, I think much of the clinical work to date is uh, implanting pretty much one of the one of the TAVI valves, the Sapien series of valves, within um, degenerate mitral bioprostheses. Um, there have been some uh, reasonable results. There's been a report from the, the VIVID, the Worldwide uh, Valve in Valve Registry, um, reporting re you know, reasonable outcomes, but probably a higher risk than one sees with aortic valve in valve uh, procedures. Um, there are a number of uh, technical challenges. Uh, Transapical access gives you good access, um, uh, nice coaxial access. Yeah, much more difficult to do these procedures transeptally, although uh, they have been done. It's 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 a it's a much bigger technical challenge to to get coaxial. Um, our experience is uh, is not very large. We've we've done three patients, uh, but more by luck than judgment. I think they've <laughs> they've done well, um, but they they tend to be very sick patients. You know, they tend to have severe mitral regurgitation. They're often in NYHA 3-4, so it's a challenging population. And, of course, we're using a device that wasn't designed to be used in this space, um, and there are challenges in getting the right sizing right. There are reports of late migration, presumably where the valve has not been oversized enough. Um, I think most of us probably feel you should be over oversizing by two or three millimetres in, in diameter. Um, and I, I wonder where this is going to go, because I, I suspect this field will become dominated by devices specifically designed for implantation in the mitral position rather than using a, an aortic device. Okay. So how do you see that development going? What specific developments are required, do you think? Um, well, I think some of the devices that are in development would, would potentially be amenable to being implanted in, uh, in bioprocessors. So you mean the, the, the devices for de novo implantation? That's exactly, sorry, I didn't make that clear, perhaps. There, what, I was, what I was alluding to was I think the devices that are being developed for de novo implantation will probably supersede Sapien in, a, in the valve-in-valve -valve procedures. Yeah. And you were saying one of the series of Sapien... Uh, one of the iterations of Sapien, but in fact, my understanding is that you want the shortest uh, device you can have. So presumably, we're almost limited to XT. Is that correct? Yes, I, I think XT is probably a better design for mitral valve in valve than Sapien three. Um, Sapien three, you're going to have the, the new cuff, which produces great results in terms of reducing paravalve leak in the aortic position. Is all going to be sticking. Uh, sticking up in the left atrium and therefore will potentially be very uh, thrombogenic. Uh, the device, the Sapien 3, is significantly higher or taller than the XT, which therefore may give you more LVOT problems. So if I had to choose, I would see the XT as a better device for this than the S3. Okay. George, when you're doing a surgical mitral valve repair, do you always put a ring in? Yes. We do, because we want to have good and durable results over time. And we learned, as we discussed already, that we have to put a ring in, semi rigid, for instance, to see over time also this shrinkage of the uh, annulus. Okay. If we don't do it, we have, we, a further uh, LV uh, remodeling is happening, and, and we see enlargement of uh, the ventricle annulus, etc. So 
Always go for, with the ring. Okay. Now, it's becoming clear that the best substrate for a valve in ring is a semi-rigid, complete ring. Now, what are the technical considerations when you're operating on the first time for your choice of ring? Um, as you have said, we, we always think of what is getting, uh, f what is coming up in, in, the, in the future. So uh, we, we are using semi-rigid rings at the time. We have used already rigid ones in the past, but we have learned that we try to be more flexible in the annular area uh, because uh, we know about the saddle shape, we, bow, uh, we know more about the movements of the annulus. If it's, if it's getting too stuck with a rigid, uh, very rigid ring, uh, we, we get into problems and uh, ejection fraction is reduced due to this uh, uh, discontinuity uh, we, we're getting to out of those uh, rigid rings. But nowadays, we always think of w what is the right bioprothesis we can put in. If we think uh, in a younger patient, if we have to go for a uh, valve stent into a bioprothesis later on, because younger patients, we're talking about younger patients if they are uh, between 60 and 75. These are the younger generation cardiovascular patients. So that's also a point which we uh, look at um, not to, not avoiding any any uh, stent into a valve, okay. into a bioprocedure. So you're already, as surgeons, taking into account the transcatheter technologies that if are available. We, if we are treating younger patients, yes. If we are tre treating patients, not our normal patients between, let's say, 75 and 90, uh, there's there's no much concern that this bioprocedure uh, will not last uh, long enough. Um, uh, to, to have uh, fun with at life. Okay. Nina, could you give us a summary of your experience with valve in ring procedures? I, I would add as a caveat, having discussed this before this session, there's six of us around the table and perhaps between us we've done, well, little more than a handful of these valve in ring, valve in valve procedures. So they're really being done very rarely. But perhaps you could just give us a, a flavor of, of the procedures that you've been involved in. So we, uh, we just have a couple of case series published. So um, there's not much uh, knowledge about the procedure. So what we learned so far, it's doable. So if you have a, a semi-rigid ring, you, um, you can implant a Sapien XT valve, and uh, the ring adapts very nicely to the shape of the Edwards valve. That is something we know. We know it from bench tests, and uh, we know it from a couple of uh, cases done. So this works. Um, so there are some issues which are not really addressed. So we don't have the perfect technique how to implant the valve. So uh, which technique uh, should we do? Should we go for transapical? Uh, should we go transeptal? Should we use um, an anterior venous uh, loop, whatever, to um, direct the valve a little bit better? So we don't have the perfect technique right now. And um, so what, what's really charming with the procedure, I think, um, it's very slowly done. So if you, um, if you deploy the valve, it's a very controlled, very slow balloon dilation, and you can really um, watch and observe what's going to happen. And if the valve is coming a little bit oblique, you sometimes can uh, direct it a little bit more. So in these cases, it's a really, so from a technical perspective, it's a very easy procedure. So I remember one case where, um, where um, they tried, it was a TCT case actually, where they tried to uh, implant an Edwards, Edwards XT valve in a, in a rigid ring, and that was not really um, uh, a nice result. So, um, so this doesn't adapt. Yeah, the ring is rigid, so nothing can adapt, and there was a, a huge paravalvular leakage on each side. I don't know if somebody so, saw the case, but yeah. I don't think it, it will work in these cases. But with semi-rigid rings, very nicely. So, uh, may I add something? Because uh, you said that it's so easy to perform. I think you're, you're talking about professionalists who are going to have done already one or two cases or even more. Um, and the planning is uh, very important. So if you know the area, the perimeter, the size, the AP and SL length of your ring, then you know exactly what to do. 
And this is done uh, a CT and a TE before. So there's strict planning, etc., to do a professional approach to those uh, we've seen. Easy it is if you have your, your wire in place and your valve stand comes up and then you take your time, which you said, and to implant it. But even though it looks very easy on the NGO and ECHO what we see uh, during um, deployment, but then you start with 50-50% up into the atrium and to the ventricle. And then at the last moment, you, you walk more towards uh, the atrium because you want to have a nice alignment and secondly, you don't want to see any, any LVUT obstruction. So you have to know what, you, what you're exactly doing. Mm -hmm. okay. two, two important points in terms of the procedure. Coaxial alignment is absolutely key. If right. you're not coaxial, yeah. uh, it's very difficult to place, particularly in a ring. And the second point is that your alignment is therefore based on your transapical puncture or the, uh, the position of your transeptal and your ability to get... Uh, to get uh, coaxial transeptally. So your access uh, and your ability to become uh, coaxial with the implant, uh, the ring is extremely important. Yeah, and so for instance, if you come uh, for the aortic valve, you can do it transfemorally or you can do it uh, transeptically. But if you come, uh, you're going to for the mitral valve, you should, or it's better to come from the transepical side because you can come more coaxial, perpendicular. And you try to get uh, not too much um, stent into the LA because you fear that there is getting some thrombosis on the on the low flow area in in the base uh, groove of the uh, left atrium. So at least um, you have to have all these concerns uh, together, and then you go for a professional, quick, nice looking implantation. And am I right in thinking there have been procedures done via a thoracotomy through the left atrium? Yeah. Transatrial is another nice approach. It again yeah. allows usually pretty good coaxial alignment. Uh, and those procedures have been done either valve and valve, valve and ring, uh, or, uh, or more recently valve in uh, natural, native uh, mitral valve stenosis and heavily calcified valve. And you've done one of those? Uh, the procedure performed re most recently in, uh, in Montreal with, uh, with Nick Piazza, uh, Joe Martucci in the group there. Yeah, very successful procedure uh, in a patient with uh, heavy, heavy calcification of the native, native mitral valve and the annulus. Uh, and the valve, uh, a sapien XT, was implanted under, uh, under direct visualization. So that was, the, that was a transatrial? Yes. On bypass and opening the atrium? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Right, so not a... Okay, fine, good. George, I know you have a, your valve in development, but to start with, can you give us an overview as to where we are in terms of de novo mitral valve implantation? So what the players are, where they are in terms of development and any outcome data that there may or may not be? Yeah. So if you look for the uh, uh, valve stents which have been already implanted into, into humans, uh, you have to, uh, to come to three valve stents. One is uh, the Tiara valve from Neowesk, um, developed in Tel Aviv, Israel. And they have implanted already, to my knowledge, about three valve stents which work very nicely. They have uh, mainly three anchors, two towards the... Uh, uh, anterior side into the uh, uh, trigones and uh, one towards the uh, P2 area. So they have three main uh, subvalvular anchors and a nice um, small cuff towards the left atrium. And uh, so far, two of them are surviving and one they lost because of dialysis, etc., difficulties in, in volume shifts. So this is one of the uh, three um, already implanted and human implanted valves since the next one is uh, cardiac U that might, uh, uh, cardiac will be introduced uh, by Lars. And uh, the third one is the uh, Fortis from uh, Edwards uh, okay. Life Sciences. And they have done already eight implantations and going forward and uh, can yeah, you, very interesting. Can you tell us about your valve? So my valve is kind of Luther valve in the literature, but I didn't uh, name it by my own. So uh, it's more a scientific uh, a name for what, what I brought up uh, seven years ago. And this valve stand was originally uh, a circular valve stand with a nice uh, atrial cuff 
and a cylinder towards the uh, left ventricle. And uh, it has uh, four tethers towards the uh, AP myocardium. So it has neocords, which uh, has, is the third fixation site on the epi myocardium. So you have the possibility of um, sitting with your valve stand uh, on, in the groove of the left atrium. Then you have uh, uh, minimal radial force towards the annulus. And then you have third, you have a fixation towards the AP myocardium. And out of this uh, scientific approach, uh, a couple of years later, so four years ago, um, I gave uh, this valve sent into the hands of Tendine, and then they professionalized this kind of uh, Luther valve. And uh, Tendine is much more um, uh, yeah, professional, and it's, uh, it's a, a D shape, so kidney-like shape, and it's much more, it's, it's aligned uh, nicely towards the A2, which is the most critical area, and it has only one tether towards the AP myocardium where it's fixed, and um, yeah, it's so um, it's really uh, a new valve, the tendine valve, and this has been already implanted acutely in two patients in America, and they showed uh, that the valve stand works. They could uh, diminish the uh, LV EDP and the vetch pressure enormously by half of it. And so far it worked very well. And uh, this autumn, uh, another chronic cases, uh, chronic cases will be done with this 10-9 valve. Lars, it's not the cardiac cue, it's just the cardiac, as you told me earlier. Perhaps you could give us your experience with the cardiac valve. The cardiac valve is a little bit different design than the the other valves, uh, because it's it's anchored with two set of there's actually two set of anchors, one from the left ventricle and one from the left atrium, which grasp around the mitral apparatus. So there's also, as George mentioned, a very little radial force because you can't really use radial force in the mitral space if you don't have any calcification. You're going to obstruct the obstruct the left ventricle outflow tract. You have the coronary sinus, the circumflex artery. So you need some other kind of mechanism, and. Um, and also, this valve is, is sitting almost purely in the left atrium, and we can discuss whether that's causing a problem for, for thrombus formation. Uh, we haven't seen that so far, but the patient has also, also been on, on warfarin and aspirin. But again, to minimize uh, the obstruction of the left ventricular alpha tract, which I think it's, it's going to be one of the major issue also in, in patient selections, just as we discussed with valve and valve, we have to talk about this auto mitral angulation, what's the risk for the patients uh, to have an alpha tract obstruction. And how many procedures have been done? There's been done four procedures. The first one was done two years ago, back in 2012, as a trans femoral transeptal procedure. Right. And afterwards, the company have modified the frame and also modify the delivery system. So they actually have two delivery systems now, one valve, two delivery system, one for transfemoral approach and one for transapical. So this year that's been done three transapical. So in total, four cases. Okay. What French are they? It's uh, around 30, 33 French system. For the, for, for the, yeah, it was the same for the, for the transfemoral. But again, remember this is a venous access. Yeah, sure. Uh, it's, it's, it's not really a, a problem. Yeah, and how did the patients do? We had, uh, there's two patients surviving of the patients we did this year. We had three, at the end, good implantation, well-functioning valves. The one patient passed away after nine days due to pneumonia. Two other patients are home and living by themselves independently, doing well, uh, have a lot of symptom relief. Uh, the valve was working fine, so. Okay, and presumably these were pretty sick patients. It was a very sick patient, and also compared to the patients treating with the oil valves, uh, quite old patients, uh, between 80 and 89 years old. Okay, all right. Neil, what's your experience with de novo mitral valve implantation? Um, I have no clinical experience, but I've, I've got some preclinical experience with, with two of the devices. Um, to, 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 that's the Tendine device and um, uh, the excuse me, the Medtronic uh, device, which are very different. Um, I would agree with what Georg says about the Tendine device. I think it's it, it's very nice, and it, it does lend itself to a wide range of pathologies. 
uh, which is a, which is a, an attraction. Um, I think um, I won't say anything more about that because Gail's covered it. Uh, the uh, Medtronic device is a, again a different style of device. Um, it's really been devised particularly looking at secondary mitral regurgitation uh, and uses leaflet capture, mitral leaflet capture as its primary uh, fixation. Perhaps its big difference at, at the moment to the devices as well as it's being planned to be implanted through a transatrial approach. So the device will go through the atrium, through the mitral valve, and the support arms will come back and capture the leaflets. And there's a degree of fixation on the atrial side with a nice and old cuff that is configured to try to produce a, a, an atrial seal. So again, they're, they're, you know, they're all versions on a, a theme, and I think all of, these, all of these designs have their advantages and disadvantages. Um, I suppose my, my concern in the long term with the transapical approach for functional mitral regurgitation is, um, you know, those ventricles are large, there's a lot of wall tension, those apexes are pretty thin. And I, I'm, I'm just a little nervous that, that, that one might get into access root problems yeah, in those big dilated ventricles through a transapical approach. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Dar can I, can I add something? Yeah. Um, interesting is also that the devices are different, as we discussed already. The uh, cardiac uh, device is coming from both sides, like kind of uh, nitinol sandwich technique. One, the um, uh, tiara is more going to, to be subvalvularly uh, anchored, and the uh, tendine device is more anchored towards the AP myocardium with the neocord. And uh, this is all very interesting. So what, how is it coming up? Which, is, which device uh, is, is going to make it in which uh, disease? So what, what is best for them? That's what we don't know yet. And uh, what is good for two devices, as, as Neil mentioned, 109, and also looking like uh, the Medtronic one is one of them. You can fully uh, deploy and analyze the device, which we don't have in the Tavi scene right now. Uh, normally you have to 80% you can release and then you don't have full function. Uh, uh, Korvov has, Evolute has, 80% release and then, but if you can fully uh, position it like in 109 and Medtronic, then you can analyze it and you can retrieve it nicely. Now this, I think this is uh, an advantage of those uh, valve stands. We'll see whether also other uh, valve stands like the Gorman device, for instance, whether they, they can make it with these special uh, effects uh, because it makes it easier to deploy and analyze. And uh, secondly, you can decide whether the, this size fits to the patient annulus, etc., and to the function you want to see. Okay, Darren. How quickly do you think these mitral valve prostheses are going to develop? So of the TAVI prostheses, particularly the Sapien prosthesis, that's developed a lot over just the last six, seven years. I don't know how constrained the mitral valve prostheses are going to be by the complexity of the disease they have to treat. I think as, uh, as, we've, as we've alluded to, we have a lot of ingenious solutions to uh, a variety of problems that uh, that we're encountering, yet we don't even know if treatment of uh, functional mitral regurgitation is associated with improved outcomes. So we don't know if the disease that we're trying to treat um, is beneficial. We don't know the type of patients that we should be treating. Um, uh, some of the companies have gone after patients with ejection fractions of 5 to 10 percent, but poor results. Other companies have gone after ejection fractions of 30 to 40 percent with better results. Um, the age profile of our patients is different. Um, so I, I think that the, um, the curve towards commercialization and, and real um, uh, getting these devices into the hands of physicians to treat their patients is going to be a lot slower than that that we've seen with TAVI. Indeed, the, the, the TAVI and transcatheter mitral valve um, uh, journey started at approximately the same time. TAVI has arrived and um, transcatheter mitral valve is a long, long way behind. Um, I think if in five years' time we know who we should be treating, um, with what device, and we have two to three second to third generation devices that have been successfully implanted in a couple of hundred patients, I think we'll be, we'll be smiling. Okay. 
That was going to be my summary. <laughs> <laughs> Lars, you, you seem to be a little less pessimistic about development with the cardiac valve. You, uh, I seem to get the impression you thought it was developing quite nicely. I think, and, and I also think that, um, I think it's very encouraging that there's four valves now going into patients. So it's also saying that quite a few technology will work in, in such a complex anatomy as a mitral space. And, um, and I also agree with you, Darren. Of course, we need to see which patient we need to treat in the long term, but that'll take a long time. Just look at the time. We're still do, doing trials and intermediate risk and next will be low risk patients. So, but that's for sure, there's a lot of on met demand out now for, for mitral intervention. There's a lot of symptomatic patients and uh, which will benefit from a procedure. And, and I think if, if we can get the system down in size, maybe do it even less invasive uh, as a transfemoral approach, uh, controlling steering systems, uh, I think this could be a technology which uh, may be more simple than some of the repair technology and, and also a technology which will one technology will fit everyone um, okay. as for the TAVI. Yeah. One valve. Okay. Nina, where do you think we're going to be in this mitral space in five and ten years' time? Five to ten years. <laughs> um, actually, I was I was really thinking that uh, we come up with four valves is, is quite a big amount of valves, so we have different approaches. But uh, the mitral valve is more complex, and we will have even more approaches. I think in the future, maybe totally different approaches um, to implant a valve. Um, I would say Darren is right. So what we will see in the future is um, some developments, um, minor um, device alterations, because we saw with the first in man experience, the valves work somehow. They are stable in position, so we have patients that survive. So you can work on that. And um, you'll have uh, the first feasibility trials, you will have safety trials, and uh, um, maybe a few hundred patients treated after five years. I don't think that the development will be so rapidly as with uh, the Arctic valve because it's, it's much more simpler. It's, it's easier. And um, I think we might even need more device iterations on the way um, as, um, as more than with uh, the Arctic valve. But, but I would agree with Darren. So uh, in five to 10 years, we, we will be able to have two, three, I wouldn't say maybe four, two, three valves, which when we know the valves work and uh, we can use them and we have to, but that's the same with every device. So you have to, you learn by doing um, what are the patients um, we want to treat and we can treat? So what is the pathology we can treat? And uh, so we figure, we figure that out by doing it over the years. And if, we, and if we look at the development of TAVI initially, between 2002 when the first case was done and 2007, there were approximately 450 cases done worldwide. It's not a lot of cases over a five-year period to put a stent tube in a, in a relatively oval orifice. Yeah, but after a while, it, it explodes. And then it explodes. Mm. Because, at, yeah. at, at a certain point. Yeah, you need a lot of experience, uh, especially in the mitral uh, approach, to understand how it works and uh, how, how you can improve your device, etc. And this will even take more time than in the TAVI, this will the be TAVI more, side. This will be more operator-dependent, more imaging-reliant, right. greater patient selection and much more interaction between surgeon and interventional cardiologist, more than we've seen with our, with our heart teams now. Mm. But again, remember, TAVI in the beginning was not an easy story. No. There was a lot of uh, complications and True. poor outcome. It's, it's really changed. And, um... Neil? Uh, I mean, I, I, do, I agree with, with Nina. I think it will be much slower than, than TAVI. Um, but despite that early start, you know, with, within 10 years, we've, we're over 100,000 implants. Um, I think here we will face more challenges. I think there will, with TAVI, really, with apart from some minor device iterations, we're using the same valves that started off in them, you know, seven, eight years ago. Um, here I would see that the devices will iterate a lot more. There'll be a lot more changes in delivery systems. And I think one thing we've not touched on, of course, is that the, du the durability 
of bioprosthesis in the mitral position is much, much shorter than the aortic. So, you know, I think that, that will limit the patient population that will be applicable to being treated with these devices. Um, unless, and of course, we, people need to think about putting a device in that perhaps leaves you with another catheter-based option afterwards. So I think it's a, it's a much more difficult space, and I would see it growing substantially, but not in the way that Tavi has. Hmm. Okay. Thank you. Another great session. Um, I think it's clear that we're moving to a position where we're more interested in mitral valve implantation than mitral valve repair. But still within the space of mitral valve implantation, there are two or three different disease states. And within each disease state, there are several devices that are applicable. But even now, after we've been using these devices for five, six, seven years, we've still, apart from with the exception of MitraClip, we've really only done a, a handful of each procedure. So again, it's a very interesting area, but probably a very slow moving area. Thank you very much.